All right, our title today is called Stalking the Church, My Experience with an Anti-Trinitarian. Pretty bold title. Now, now, stalking the church, what does stalking, does anybody know what stalking is? Following. Following, but is it in a good way? No. Stalking is more like stealthfully, craftiness. It's, it's uh, following something with probably a, not such a wholesome intent. Stalking the church. We're going to be talking about stalking the church, and um, uh, I want to share my uh, personal experience I had with someone that uh, many people would call an anti-Trinitarian. Uh, let's start, though, with a text. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, and let's use this as our theme text here. Ephesians, Ephesians 4, verse 11. You got your Bibles there. Ephesians 4, verse 11. A familiar text, I think many of you. So we have Ephesians 4 and verse 11. The Bible says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the, and what's that next word? The unity, right? Unity, and that's, that's our key word for this, uh, this presentation. The word is what? Unity. unity. Okay, let's say that in unity. Unity. All right. So the key word is unity. Uh, Till we all come in the unity. What does God want in his church? Unity. He wants unity. The unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to be a perfect man to the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by, with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting. And so um, that is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He is, I mean, the gifts are given by the Holy Spirit to bring us into unity, aren't they? So what I want to do today is I wanted to share a personal experience I had, my experience with an anti-Trinitarian. Now here is another text, Proverbs 6 and verse 16. The Bible says, this is Solomon, and he, was he very smart, Abigail? Was he like the smart guy, or was he kind of like the goof off in the class? Solomon, King Solomon, what was he known for? Big intelligence, right? The wisest man that ever lived, and I would say until Jesus came along, right? So the wisest man that ever lived, he wrote this. He said, these six things does the Lord... Did you know the Lord hates some things? Does the Lord hate? The Lord doesn't like some certain things. Six things the Lord hates. Yay, what's that next word? Seven. Seven. Uh-oh, he's going to add an extra one. Seven are an abomination unto him. What are those seven things? All right, let's look at them. Number one, a proud look. Now, we all understand that the reason Satan fell from heaven was his pride. Right? He looked in the mirror and and like that little picture where you see the kitten looking in the mirror and what he sees is a great big lion, you know? He puffed himself up, he was proud, a proud look. And that's where all the pride uh, that humanity experiences comes from. It comes from Satan's influence. And number two, a lying tongue. Now nobody likes a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Uh, number four, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Some people are just bent on this kind of, uh, their imagination can just go all over the place, and they can come up with some just evil things, wicked imaginations. Then feet that be swift to, in running to mischief. And then number six, a false witness that speaks lies. And number seven, he that soweth discord among brethren. Now why do you suppose the author, King Solomon, he starts out by saying six things, and he says, wait a minute, seven things. Then he adds seven. Why do you think he does that? The reason probably is, and you can read this by the context before verse 16, is he wants us to pay particular attention to number seven. Amen? So number seven he that soweth discord among brethren. That was sort of up until verse 19. That was what Solomon was talking about. He's singling, singling out those that cause discord among the believers. And so, and Paul kind of backs this up. In Romans 16, verse 17, Paul says, to note 
those who cause divisions in the church and avoid them. King James says, mark those that cause divisions and avoid them. And so often, we in the church put up with this kind of thing. We put up with people that are divisive. And, uh, but the Bible asks us, Paul admonishes us, note those, mark those who cause divisions chronically. I, I know sometimes we have a disagreement, sometimes we, you know, we do. That's not what he's talking about. But there's sometimes there are people in the, in the church who will just be at your, you know, just contentious all the time. Paul says to avoid them. Now, how many of you have ever heard that there are offshoots from our church? There are offshoots from Adventism. Offshoots from, has anyone ever heard that? Heard of such a group? Okay, so now here's just a few of the more notable ones in this particular church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. We have, uh, we have the 2520, have, have you heard of that movement? The 2520, the, it caused some problems. I don't think it's such a big, strong group anymore that I know about. Then we have the Feast Keepers, uh, people who believe that uh, the, feasts, the feasts that were in Leviticus 23 are still binding on us today and we should be observing those uh, j- just like they did in the Old Testament times. Those are, when the Bible says that this is a statute or these feasts are a perpetual thing forever and they take that, well, that means forever. I mean, we're supposed to be doing that. And so uh, we, we believe and the Seventh-day Adventist Church is strongly of the opinion and the biblical opinion that when Christ died, he fulfilled the part of the Passover lamb, which was a feast, and therefore there, the sacrifices that go along with these feasts are no longer binding. There is a spiritual essence to this and a, a deep spiritual meaning that, are, that is involved with the, the feast keeping, and we learn from those. In fact, in time, eschatology is wrapped up in a lot of this. And uh, so that's the feast keepers. That's another uh, offshoot. And then we have the anti-Trinitarians. The anti-Trinitarians. Now, these three groups, they do share three things in common when it comes to the relationship with the Seventh-day Adventist church, with this church. Number one, they draw away. For their membership, they tend to draw away from the organized body. Uh, And number two, they believe that they are the church. And number three, they identify themselves as Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, so, well, my experience with an anti-Trinitarian, it started about, in the year about, around 2006. In 2006, there there were two big things going on in our family at the time. Number one, we were, had, were in the middle of a, probably a one-year, or may, maybe a little bit longer, a one-year house search. We know we live in a home with seven people, and it has two bedrooms and one bathroom. And we've been there for a long time. We were feeling kind of cramped. So anyway, this has been going on with us for a long time. We felt cramped, and we were, in the, we were looking to find another home. And so this has been going on. We're looking here and looking there, and the Lord is systematically shutting doors, right and left. We'd, we'd find something we thought would be a good idea, the Lord would shut the door. You know, we'd pray about it, God said, okay, you want an answer? No, that's the answer. You know, but I want that answer. If, if it's not good for me, I, I, like, I like the no's. I'm totally fine with the no as long as it's from the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, no, I, and I'm fine with that. So this has been going on. We decided, well, let's try to remodel our house. The Lord said, no, okay? I mean, seriously, we... we we had a, a contractor who was uh, scheduled to come out. We had the plans drawn, and the contractor, uh, the local contractor, he comes out. The day he comes out, a, a, a seasonal flood sprung up from our, underneath our house, leaving a couple of inches, three or four inches of water just sitting there. And as soon as he saw that, he said, don't waste your money on a remodel in this house. I'm not even gonna, I, I'm not even gonna t- take your money or anything. I just, he says, let's build a new one somewhere else. And uh, anyway, that's what the Lord was saying. He was basically saying, no. So we expanded our search. Uh, you know, let's go find something somewhere else, farther out. And eventually the, the search got expanded to the whole United States. We were looking everywhere, and God was shutting doors. We would call on places, and uh, uh, we found a place that we just loved. We'd call a realtor, and the realtor would say, you know, that's the funniest thing. This thing's been on the market for years, and no one's ever called. And just, be, just, just uh, 15 minutes ago, someone called and made an offer on it, and now it's an escrow. You're just too late. 
That happened many times. We, we started kidding the uh, realtors that, and by say, telling them, if you really want to sell your house, ask us to look at it, and somebody else will buy it. it, it it's guaranteed. So this was going on in 2006. The other thing that was going on in 2006 is, is that our family was called to share a testimony at 3ABN uh, on the 3ABN Today program, which is a, Chris, a Christian television network. And uh, we were called to Illinois, Southern Illinois, to go out and share uh, what turned out to be the Modern Day Resurrection book. And so here we are, we're on the set of the 3ABN Today program, and we did a, the program, the, it was a lot of fun, and uh, we had a, a good experience with this. Now, there was a certain person who watched the program. Uh, the person's name was Betty. And Betty was, she, uh, I met her later, Betty told me that when she saw that program, and uh, she started praying, she said, I'm, she says, Lord, won't you send that family to my church? You know, I, I, I don't know, maybe we mentioned something on the program that says we were, I, I may have spilled the beans that we were house hunting all over the United States. And uh, so she told me that she saw us and she said, I was praying for you to move to my church. I got on my knees and started praying. And here's a picture of Betty right there. There's Betty Dye right there. Uh, and there's Roland, her husband. And this is a little picture of us doing a Revelation seminar. There's my wife right there. There's the pastor, real small little Bible study. So this is going on. Hundreds of doors being closed, nationwide search, and we were getting tired. You can imagine being tired of making offers and hearing the word, no, you know? I, I, you know, this just seemed like it was a waste of time. We're, we're getting nowhere. So we decided on this trip, and we were in our motorhome, by the way, we're driving through, you know, all over, we have, we're going everywhere, looking at homes and properties and hearing the no's, uh, when we got back, we decided we're going to quit making offers after we make offers on two of the homes that we saw. We saw on our trip, we saw two places. One was in Springerton, Illinois, which is near 3 Avian. The, o the other one was in, um, on Sand Mountain in Alabama. And so what happened, we decided what we're going to do is we're going to make our final offers. This is it. This Lord, we're, we told the Lord, we made a promise to the Lord. What we'll do is if... if we're going to offer on this one, and we're going to offer on that one. And when they say no, which I'm sure they will, then that's it. We're not going to make any more offers. We're going to be content with what we have. You know, we're going to get used to this. We're already used to it. But anyway, we're going to get used to this. So what we did, we said, now, Thursday night at midnight, that's our deadline. Thursday night, so we called the Springerton people, the realtor, and said, all right, this is our offer. And it was a, a pretty solid offer, you know. We wanted them to throw in their tractor. And uh, we offered a little bit less than they were asking. And um, we made that offer and threw it out there and got till Thursday midnight, you know. And then we called the Alabama property and we made a ridiculous offer on this one, you know, because it needed some work. So we decided, well, we'll go real low. We'll ask for owner financing. And uh, uh, so that way we can, you know, maybe get that Illinois place if, if we're going to get anything. You know, we wanted that place. It was ready to move into. And so anyway, we made the offer. Now what happened was a backhoe accident determined the destiny of the answer to this prayer. Here we have a picture of a backhoe who just dug into a phone line. And what, what happened was the Illinois people were trying to accept, the, 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 the owner accepted the offer. No questions asked, no counter offer, I'll take the offer. And so she was trying to call the realtor to give her the information that they're gonna take the offer. And the phone didn't work because the, the backhoe got through there and, and ruined the, the phone line. And so they couldn't call, so, uh, and, and they didn't get it fixed till after Thursday midnight. They didn't get that phone going. And then the other people in Alabama, they accepted the offer be just before midnight. They accepted the offer, owner financing, the low ball offer, and so that determined which house. You know, we, we thought we were gonna get two no's. We got, we got a yes. And so, and that was in Alabama. And we moved in to our home, which I call, and I, I we call, I, I gave it the nickname of Bam Bam, because it's in Alabama, Bam, you know, and so, anyway, I called this place Bam Bam because it's this giant mountain of a house. It was, it had leaky windows, it had a leaky roof, we had to replace this roof, and the, we, this used to have a, a widow's nest on the top, and it's, we had to replace that roof, and yeah, uh, it looks fine on the outside, but this is the inside. This is what we bought into. A project, a major project. 
So here we are, we're going to work. There's, there's me right there, and there's Alex, and we're learning about carpentry. We got a construction. I don't know how the bank thought we would be good enough to be trusted for a construction loan, that they gave us this construction loan. You know, just an open it, just fix it till it's done. We'll give you the money. You're serious, okay, well, you know. I mean, things were just falling into place. So um, we went to work, here we are, just, it's just timber inside, you know. And we had to go to work. We started remodeling, we built the bathroom, we, I had to fix the foundation, we put jacks because some of the things weren't, weren't built right. Um, and uh, we started just fixing the money, the bank's money. And we started fixing the house. It was a major project. It was three stories. The third story uh, was designated for ministry work. Uh, here I am making a little arch on the, above a tub there, and there's a, into the master bathroom. It was a pretty fancy house, um, but um, it was a lot of work. Here we are, we're, we're working on this thing. The third floor was the ministry office that really helped Desire Media uh, become developed. And in there, um, we had a, 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 you know, the film studio, we had the, uh, a recording studio, an audio studio, and um, you know, a guest room and a bathroom and a big long, it was a lot of room, and, and so it was a, a very useful, useful place for ministry. Now, just when we're getting close to getting done with the house, uh, that was around the year 2008. And, and 2008, everybody goes, see, listen to uh, Nikki, see, Mm. 2008 is, is notorious for the, ba the big economic crash, right? Mm -hmm. uh, almost like a depression. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it was just like the, for, for many of us, it was like a depression because we had a business that could afford this kind of stuff. And once that happened, our business was just, just like a, a rug was underneath it and it was like yanked out from the, under the business. And now all of a sudden the business is not making money anymore and it began to crash with the economy. The business started to, to crash. But our ministry started to increase and flourish, right? Our, our business shrank, uh, but the ministry boomed. I mean, it's just because uh, I didn't have a lot of use to go to work. It wasn't doing anything. I'd try to work and market our business, and nothing was going right. And so, but everything with ministry was going right, you know? I started writing a series of study guides, which we call Revelation 101, a survival training course right now. And... and uh, we got those study guides all written. We, we, we wrote that for a, a Revelation seminar. We were called into evangelism in the Gulf states. Somebody wanted to, to, to give this a go. Uh, and you know, we had the, the film studio set up, the recording studio. We even did cooking shows here. There's the kitchen. And we did some cooking shows. You can find those on our YouTube channel. Uh, this one is Papa's Pancakes. It's the goofiest thing. It really is. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm such a bad cook, Karen. If you watch that, you'll laugh. But, it, 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 but it, it's wholesome, you know, dumbest recipes in the world, but the kids are involved. It's just something for kids. The main thing I wanted out of ministry at first was that the children be involved with ministry work. And so, you know, okay, that was what's going on in our home. Now, for our church, we chose the Rainsville, Alabama church. And that's the church right here, <clears throat> this nice little country, a southern church uh, in the Bible Belt in, uh, on Sand Mountain in Alabama. Now guess who we met when we came to church here in Rainsville? Betty. We met Betty. And Betty told her, us her story. She just, and she told us that she was praying that we would move to her church. And, and lo, we had no idea. Boy, that is, now that is a faithful lady. She had this, you know, we, we, oh, we often kid with her. Well, thanks a lot. Look at you got us into here. You know, you, your prayers are pretty powerful. And sometimes the prayers of our saints are indeed very powerful. Has anyone ever experienced that, where your prayers really seemed to tug on the heartstrings of God? Sometimes that happens. So we met Betty here and her husband, wonderful, wonderful people. Now also, now on our first day in this church, we also met who I'm going to call Miss Ms. T. That's not her real name, but we're going to give her the name of Ms. T. Now we... She sort of kind of cornered me and my family and made, started making, us friend, making friends and stuff like that and said a few things. I don't remember exactly what she said, but I do remember what she, uh, this part of what she said. She said to me on our very first encounter here, you don't want to believe in that old Holy Spirit doctrine, do you? A and the Trinity. She says, there's really only the Father and the Son. And she said, on that Holy Spirit, you don't want to believe in that. Now, up until this time, I had never heard of an anti-Trinitarian. I didn't know there was this offshoot 
in our church. I didn't know about that. Uh, other people knew about it and had been dealing. It's kind of new where they are in, you know, involved with the saints at the Adventist church. And so um, it, it, I just kind of blew it off. I thought, well, that's kind of a weird thing to say. I don't think, that, I don't think that's in line with our doctrinal statement, but uh, okay, whatever. You, you, know, you have, have your opinion there. Oh, that's great. And um, this really is a, a there's a common uh, scheme of the devil. Uh, and that common scheme in the church is to attack new people that come to the church with unorthodox or strange ideas. Um, uh, this little church, this little country church is I, uh, almost immune, but I, I don't think you are. But there, it's not that you see that very often. But big churches, you'll really experience this. There's somebody in there that's stalking the church, as it were. And so, um, now let me share with you a, what I consider to be a shocking statement, and we'll come back to this statement. This is written in a book that is an uh, inspired book, Truth About Angels, and on page 266, the author writes that evil angels in the form of believers will work in our ranks to bring in a strong spirit of unbelief. They, these evil angels in the form of believers, they will assemble in our meetings not to receive a blessing, but to do what? To counterwork the influence and the spirit of God. Now, to me, that's a shocking statement. Uh, now, you've heard that the devil can possess people, right? We read about that in the Bible, and you've probably seen people who have been under the extreme influence of the, of the devil. You're, you know, they're devil-possessed in, in a sense, maybe in a mild sense, in, in, in the Bible, in a strong sense. Uh, but is that what this... Is this referring to devil possession, where, where the devil influences somebody? No, this says evil angels in the form of believers. Now, that's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? Yeah. This means it's an evil angel who is looking like a saint in the church. I, I don't know if any of us have ever, ever really considered that it's possible that the devil will infiltrate the church by pretending to be one of the church members. Do you think that happens? Now, this is what the Bible says about that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, this, this you know. Uh, it says, no marvel, and what that means, what Paul means by that is, don't be surprised by this. Don't marvel about this. I think Peter uses that same phrase. No marvel, no marvel, for Satan himself is what? He's transformed, which means to change, transformed appearance, he is changed in appearance, transformed into an angel of light. And therefore, no marvel at this either, he says, therefore it's no great thing, it's no marvel, no great thing, if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. Pretty shocking statement. But that's in the Bible, isn't it? Now, Ms. T was about, I don't know the age exactly, but at least 80 years old. Maybe 86, 87. We, I don't remember. Alex, do you remember how old she, that she was? I, I, it was at least 80, so I didn't put an age. Ms. T was also impeccably dressed, you know, looked like a saint to me. Uh, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, you know, flies like a duck, it might be a duck, right? Well, not in this case. But here we have someone who is impeccably dressed, carried around religious books. Now, I don't ever remember her carrying a Bible, but I do remember her carrying spirit of prophecy books, inspired writings, uh, religious books. And also, Ms. T also appeared very healthy. It looked like an Adventist in all respects, maybe the quintessential Adventist look. Very, very church lady-like. You know what a church lady is, right? A church, it looked like a church lady. Now, Ms. T found out that our children did not have any grandparents. And that was an opening for her. She decided she wanted to be our children's grandpa, grandma. She told the kids to call her Grammy. And she sort of be, being friendly and, and, uh, and being nice, and we invited her to our home, you know, and you know, this is kind of neat. The kids don't have a grandparents. They died, you know, or they're, they're off, off here, and, you know, they're, just, just, they're not available. They don't have grandparents. So, Maybe this could be our substitute grandma, surrogate grandma, Grammy. Call me Grammy. And she tried very hard to get into our family uh, circle. Super sweet, um, helpful. But then, as we got, you know, it might have been a couple of months of this, 
She came up to me one day and said, I wanted to share, I've been wanting to share this with you for a long time. She came up with a stack of papers. They were anti-Trinitarian uh, papers. She said, I want you just to look at these and read the texts and, and tell me what you think. Now, what does an anti-Trinitarian believe? I think by the name you can kind of tell. They, they believe that there is not a trinity, which means three. They don't believe in the three persons of the Godhead. And so they believe in the Father, right? The Father in heaven. They believe in the Son, but not exactly like we believe it in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, but they say there is no such being as the Holy Spirit. That they're, they're called anti-Trinitarians for that reason. So what does an anti-Trinitarian... Well, they believe in the deity of the Father and the deity of the Son in, to, a, uh, to a degree but not that the Holy Spirit is actual, an actual being. What the Holy Spirit is, is the Spirit of the Son. Most, and some, in some other circles, they believe it's the Spirit of the Father and the Son together. When you see the, the Holy Spirit, when God's Holy Spirit is sent out, it's the Spirit of the Father, and like, I'm with you in spirit. You know, just Jesus saying up there, I'm with you in spirit. That's my spirit with you. And that's not what Seventh-day Adventists believe at all, Right? So first, the anti-Trinitarians, they will argue that their first argument really is that po the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they rejected the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Like James, and their, their champion, of course, is James White, who is the husband of Ellen White. James White wrote in a uh, review, and hair, uh, review article, uh, well, actually, he didn't write it. Actually, John Loughborough <laughs> wrote it. He wrote a little article rejecting the Trinity. And uh, since it's published in the review, that's James White's paper, he's the editor, uh, he uh, agreed with it, and therefore the pioneers did not believe in the Trinity. And then they list another, they list uh, who's the sea captain guy, Joseph Bates, yeah. And then a number of other uh, people who rejected the idea of the Trinity. Now, if you really study into this, it's so simple. What they're rejecting is the Catholic version of the Trinity. Did you know there's a difference between the Catholic version of the Trinity and the Seventh-day Adventist version of the Trinity and most evangelical versions of the Trinity? I mean, you study into this and you'll see that, I guess it was Tertullian in uh, the early first, second, third century back in, the, in those days, who came up with the doctrine of the Trinity. He believed in consubstantialism, where there is one being who is exhibit, uh, exhibits himself in three persons, Holy Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church does not believe that. We believe there are three separate beings, right? There are three separate beings, <coughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal. It's like co-equal branches of government. We have the legislative, the judicial, and the executive, all separated by the Separation of Powers Act. The three separate powers, uh, all co-equal branches of government. That's how we believe in the Godhead. The Godhead, which is a biblical word, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're equal. They're equally God. Now, how are they one? Because the Bible does say the Lord our God is one God. So there are three different beings, but they are one in purpose, one in mind, and one in character. But they're different in function. Right? We just read in our opening text in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 about the gifts of the Spirit. His function is to give gifts to the church. That is exclusively the gift, or the, the, the function of the Holy Spirit, right? He, I, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some helps, and those are, that's the function of the Holy Spirit. So they're one in purpose, mind and character, but different in function. So number one, the argument is that the pioneers rejected the Trinity doctrine, and really what they had rejected was the Catholic version of the Trinity doctrine, and I reject that. Um, and secondly, is a doctrine wrong because the Catholic Church believes in it? If the Catholic Church believes in it, does that mean we're not supposed to believe in it? Um, Catholics also believe in the virgin birth, don't they? They believe in the divinity of Christ. Is that wrong? No, that's right, isn't it? Uh, they believe in the atonement. They believe in a physical resurrection of the dead, don't they? So, so just because uh, someone uh, adheres to a doctrine does not mean that you're supposed to automatically reject it because we reject most of their teachings. And thirdly, what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible say? Well, 
Of course, in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus says to the disciples, Go ye into all nations and uh, teach them and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Now, what, are, what is a rational mind supposed to do with a statement like that? The Father, so is Jesus, now this is from Jesus, right, who is, who's right there. Yeah, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, to me, that makes those three people look like they're di three different people, and they're three equal people. They're like, that's God, well, that's God, that's God, right? But there's, so they're three different beings, and they are one in, in purpose, uh, mind and character. And the Bible says, and you read in Genesis, you start with Genesis, it said, let us make man. Can you imagine? Let, God said, and the word God looks like a singular word, but it's not in Hebrew, is it? So God said, let us make man in our image. That's, some plural, that's plurality. And then it, the next verse says, the Spirit, capital S. It hovered over the face of the deep, over the waters. Uh, it hovered over the waters. So there's, oh wait, there's another one. It's like there's, there's, there's some us, there's a spirit, there's a plurality to God, isn't there? Now, of the three people in the Godhead, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which one of the three would you suppose, if you had to name one, would be the most mysterious to understand, the nature about? The, definitely the Holy Spirit, right? Yes. I would say the Holy Spirit's nature is most mysterious. Now, uh, that's not by... That's, that's, by, that's not by a coincidence, that's by design. You know, uh, Jesus said, and we'll get to this in a second, that uh, Jesus told us that when the Spirit comes, he's going to testify about himself or of me. Isn't that what Jesus said? So the Holy Spirit is, is, is not about bringing attention to himself. He's bringing attention to Jesus, isn't he? Um, so the, the Holy Spirit, the most mysterious of the three, Definitely, but we, we should believe what the, what the Bible has revealed, right? I mean, when the Bible reveals it, it's, you know, look here. The Holy Spirit, he convicts the world of sin. Uh, the Holy Spirit, is spiritual, he says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We need the discernment of the Holy Spirit to understand spiritual issues. He equips the church with needed gifts. We read about that in Ephesians uh, 4. So he has, he has gifts, he has these special gifts to equip the church for action. And it says here, grieve not the Holy Spirit. And so he's someone that can be grieved. And also in the spirit of prophecy, the author in one of the books here, uh, Ellen White, she writes that the nature of the Holy Spirit is not fully understood. But that the spirit of prophecy also tells us that the Holy Spirit is a person. Very clearly, in many places, the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, she writes about him as the third person of the Godhead. Uh, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that the Holy Spirit is a divine person, and she calls, his, uh, calls it the heavenly trio. The heavenly trio, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is a person. You, you, you've read in, in John 16 and verse 13, uh, where Jesus says, how be it when he, now what does a he represent? A person. a person, right? When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into truth. Uh, for he, you know, we're talking about purpose, right? What the, or the function, actually. We're talking about the function of the Holy Spirit. He will guide you into truth, for he shall not speak of himself, right? There's another, there's two in that little statement. He will not, not speak of himself. Who does he talk about? He drives you to Jesus, right? The Father himself, who all glory is, is and honor is uh, recommended, he drives us to, the, to, to Jesus also, because Jesus is where we find our salvation, we find there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that, therefore, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and Jesus himself are all driving us to Jesus for salvation. But whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak, and he will show you thing, things to come. So in that one text, we see, we see seven personal pronouns. He, the Spirit of truth, he shall guide you, he shall not speak of himself, he shall hear, he shall speak, he shall show. Now, what's a personal pronoun used for? It's in place of something, of a person, right? Now, this is very clearly, in Jesus' own words, it's speaking of a person. In John 16, earlier in that, in that uh, chapter, in verse 7, the disciples are kind of discouraged because Jesus just told them that he's going to be going away. I'm going to be going. 
And they're saying, well, no, please don't do that. We're going to be sad. But no, Jesus says, he says, in verse 7, he says, it's expedient, in King James, it's expedient that I go away, because if I don't go away, who won't be able to come? Yeah, the Holy Spirit won't be able to come. And you, know, and you want the Holy Spirit to come, but I've got to leave before he can come. Does that sound to me like, it, does it sound like to you that there are, that is one person? No, does it sound like Jesus is talking about his own spirit coming back to them? I've got to leave so he can come. He says, I can, I can only be with a few of you at a time, but he can be with all of you simultaneously. Now, what's a rational person supposed to do with a statement like that? It doesn't sound like it's talking about one person. I'm not, now, I'm going to have to leave you folks so I can come to you. That's not at all what Jesus is saying. And what should we make of a statement like this from Jesus? In Matthew 12, and verse 32, it says, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall, shall not be forgiven him. Now, does that sound like he's talking about this, his own spirit now? That's definitely, now this is grammatically, technically, in, in every sense of the word, this is talking about two different people, isn't it? You can, you can blaspheme, you can do all kinds of matter against Jesus, the Son, and I can forgive you for that. But don't try that with the Holy Spirit, because that won't be forgiven you. That's a warning, isn't it? And it's, it's very clearly, I don't think there's a, a clearer statement in the Bible about the separation of powers here. Holy Spirit and the Son of God, two distinct beings, right? Well, this went on for a while. Ms. T sowed these anti-Trinitarian seeds for, I counted, six years. I, six years, but someone told me later that it was, it was more, in fact, last weekend, we were, someone happened to be uh, in the audience who was in that, a member of that same church. We were in another church in Oregon, and uh, he and his wife were there in that church, and uh, the first time I've ever presented it, and he helped me, because yeah, this is, he was there to, to give a, to give credence to the message. He said, it's been going on for like 12 years. But I counted six years. Six years of sowing, six plus years of sowing these anti-Trinitarian seeds. We realized finally we had a serious problem. And the way we realized it was when we tried to do evangelism. Evangelism came up, and that's when we bring people in from the community, study the Bible with us, teach them, those that are interested, be baptized, join our church, and... Uh, so we would do that. We'd bring people in, and she would drive them out, like systematically. She would corner them one by one, and they would start leaving one at a time. They would go out. We'd bring more in. She would drive them out. And the elders were concerned. They would ask her not to do this. Let's, let's please don't do that. Uh, and, but she would not obey. We, we, we reasoned with her and sort of pled with her, and she wouldn't obey. The reason she wouldn't obey was that there were a few people in the church that <laughs> sympathized with her on this whole issue about the Trinity. That the, uh, there's not the Holy Spirit. There's a Father and the Son, but not the Holy Spirit. And there were some that sympathized. Not very many, but there was some. And we realized that it would be possibly harmful to the church had we tried to take more strong action. She portrayed herself as such a pious part of the church, really endorsing all the other doctrines. I mean, just looked like strongly endorsing all the doctrines, except for this, and, and we found out there were a number of other ones. She would endorse the doctrines. Now, does the devil ever work that way? Like to endorse something to sort of get a foot in the door? Now, there's a story in the Bible, in Acts chapter 16, this is an interesting story, because here we see uh, one of the devil's many different tools that he uses against the church. It says here, here we have Paul and Silas, they're in um, Philippi. They're in Philippi, and they're preaching the gospel, and, and it says, A certain damsel, possessed with a, a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by which unsanctified activity? Soothsaying. Now, is soothsaying, sooth, can you say that? Sooth, soothsaying. <laughs> Tongue twister. Sooth, is soothsaying a Christian activity? Sorry, what do you think? Probably not, no. Um, it's not a sanctified activity. Soothsaying. This is what, what, it, what this is all about is there are some entrepreneurs in Philippi who employ this girl who is possessed by the devil, 
and the devil speaks to her and gives her information about the future and information, inside information that nobody should really know. And when people want to know stuff, uh, secrets, they will go to these, they will pay the, the entrepreneurs and they will call on the girl and then they'll set it all up and she would go into the, whatever, the uh, divination, you know, and she would come up with an answer and many times the answers are probably pretty right, pretty accurate. Only because the devil, the devil knows things. The devil can, he, he sees things, we don't see him, but he sees us. And um, in this room right now, there are good angels. We always celebrate that, right? But did you know there's also bad angels trying to get in and influence us? And here, here's what we have in the, in the story about this in Philippi. They're following Paul and Silas around, and they're saying, this is what they're saying, what she's saying as she follows them. She followed and said, these men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Is she telling the truth? That's true. Those men are servants of the Most High God, showing the way of salvation. But do you see the strategy that the devil is employing here? Mm -hmm. This is amazing. You can't put anything past the devil, can you? This is to, uh, the, what I call discrediting by endorsing. And, and, and if you look for it, you'll see it in, in the church. So many times the devil will try to get a foot in the door and he'll try to discredit some, some aspect of the church by endorsing it. Once he endorses, you'll say, wait a minute, hmm. Now, Miss T was, was employing a similar strategy here to endorse most of our key doctrines to gain trust and sympathy. And she went on for a long time. I mean, it was six years. The Bible says in the next verse here that this girl following Paul and Silas around, she said, this happened for many days. We often read this story and think it just was out of the blue. They, she popped out there and, the, and Paul cast the devil out and that took care of that. In verse 18, it says she did, did this for many days. They're trying to work and, sh and preach the gospel on the street corners about Jesus, and she's standing right there behind them going, this, these men, they're servants of the Most High God. Now, what do you suppose that did to their ministry? The devil's endorsing them. I don't know. That doesn't seem right to me. Something, something may be fishy here. See, our problem in, uh, in Rainsville, Alabama, it lasted for more than six years. Many days. What should a church do about that? What should a church do? What do you think? Well, we tried guarding our members. You know, the new people that came in. You know, we had a new believers class. We had revelations. I, even, I did two revelation series in that church. And we'd bring people in, baptize people. And, and then we, so what we had to do, or we decided we had to do, was to guard the members. I remember uh, being one of those guards in the potluck room. See the potluck room here? There's the potluck saints here in Rainsville. And... Um, and there we are on guard. We have uh, the head deaconess, sir, and there's the big guy. I don't know who they are. They're, and here's, maybe it's me, but we were stationed, you know, and we, we decide what we'll do because what Miss T does is she goes and she tries to sit with them. She wants alone time with them. And I remember I was guarding a, a potluck table one day from new members, and of course she's there. There she is. And she's going into the anti Trinitarian thing. And, and, I have, and what our job was, we thought, was just to sort of counter those. No, that's not true. Now, listen, we do not believe what she's saying. And then the argument would take place. And, and now, this was in line with the strategy the devil used in Acts chapter 16, right? Um, number one, to make, make the church look bad to visitors. And number two, make members uncomfortable, if nothing else. Make them uncomfortable. And I heard people starting to say, you know, I don't even feel comfortable even going to that church now. It, it got really bad. It was tearing our church apart. Uh, it, it, got, it, it got escalating. And because some people sided with Ms. T, uh, we weren't exactly sure what to do and how to handle this. Would we, do we use aggressive measures? Or we, didn't, we weren't sure what to do. I remember uh, there was one family in there, um, a, fa a husband and a wife, Paul and his wife, Viola. They, were, uh, they, they split up. They eventually split up over that issue of the, of the Trinity, of the doctrine of the Trinity, the, anti, the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, from what was going on in that church. I remember one day our family was uh, driving into Chattanooga from Sand Mountain. Where, and I felt impressed for some reason to throw in this little book called The Trinity. I had this little book by Doug Batchelor. Uh, here it is. A little pamphlet. You've probably seen this. He wrote a book. I, I just put that in there. I felt impressed. And we were driving to Chattanooga. And we came across the fellow who was having a problem with his wife. I didn't really know what was going on. But 
he was sitting on the side of the freeway with his motorcycle, and he was sitting on there, and looked, looked real sad, had a flat tire, and we pulled over and said, Paul, can we help? What happened? And he goes, oh, man, he was white as a ghost. He was sweating. He was kind of shaking a little bit. He said, the devil tried to kill me. I got a flat tire on this interchange here, and I just about, I don't know how I saved it, but I, I, I know the devil is trying to kill me. He said, and I said, well, wh what do you mean? He said, well, I, my wife and I, Viola, were having this argument and about the Holy Spirit, and, and, and I told her, I'll be right back. I want to get a book for you. She, he was on his way to the, the, the Adventist Book Center to get a book called The Trinity. He was going to get this book. And um, I said, well, I, I got the book, and, and it's going to close. The store is going to close. You're not going to make it. He was waiting for a tow truck to come to fix his motorcycle tire, and, and they're not going to make it. And he just feels as his family is falling apart, his marriage is falling apart. And I said, well, if this will help, you know, I have the book with me. You can have it. So we gave him that book. And I felt the Holy Spirit impressed me to put that book in there for somebody needed it. That happens, you know. I mean, you listen to the Holy Spirit. He will tell you where the fish are that we're supposed to fish for. And, and, and he knows the situation. He orchestrates things. That's one of his functions. So I, we and I, I, I was watching all this with Ms. T, and I was realizing that something had to be done. I concluded that. Something has to be done. And, and what really cinched it for me, I was, I was watching one day, we were having a Bible study prayer meeting, Wednesday night prayer meeting in the church, and um, we had a new couple, Baptist family, father, uh, husband, wife, children, former Baptists, they believe in the Sabbath, they're studying with us in our new be beginner's class, and uh, they're, they're in prayer meeting, and they're, they're loving this. This is, this is awesome, biblical truth. Finding the, I'm, this, is, this is putting all the puzzles, pieces of the puzzle together. They're in, in prayer meeting, and I'm watching, and, and Miss T's in there, you know, and doing what she does, and we're trying to guard, and I'm sitting in the back, and, and the elder up front is asking for prayer requests. His name was Adrian. He's going, are there any prayer requests? And I look around, and I notice Ms. T, her brain was, was scheming something up. And she finally thought about it, and I watched her, and she raised her hand. She had a prayer request. Uh, she said, you know, when I was coming in here, my car started to make a funny noise, and I don't, I, it's acting up something fierce, and I think, I think it's going to break down. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it home. And what do you suppose that new family in prayer meeting volunteered to do? Oh, no. Yeah, they did. She, they, they've, and, and she was fishing for that. And so they raised their hand, well, we'll be happy to take her home. And I told, uh, Adrian, I just told them, I said, Adrian, you take her home. Do not let these people take her home. You take her home. Yeah, yes, sir, he, he took her home. And we, but I, I, you could see that she was not, her car did not break down. Her car was fine. And she wanted some alone time with our new members, with our new people. She wanted to, she wanted to, to blitz them with this information. So I, I realized that something really had to be done. What are we going to do about this? So we had meetings. We prayed about this. I was praying about this. That's when I came across that statement again in Truth About Angels, page 266. Evil angels in the form of believers will work in our ranks to bring in a strong spirit of unbelief. They will assemble in our meetings. And I would imagine whenever a meeting is being held, you can count that the devil would like somebody, one of his agents to be there in the form of a believer. They will assemble in our meetings, not to receive a blessing, but to counter at work the influence and the spirit of God. I read that and I was, I wondered about that. I thought, look at this statement. I wondered. And I, 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 I am suspicious. You know, I said, well, it, it looks like it's a common thing. And this sort of fits maybe a possible description. I shared it with the elder. I shared this on uh, Truth About Angels 266 with the elders in an elders meeting. And then I shared it with my family. And I don't know how they thought about that, but I, I, I was suspicious. And Ms. Now, now this is something that was very interesting. Ms. T, after that meeting, seemed to know that I was suspicious. about. She seemed to know that I had maybe read something like this. I had never shared this with her. She was suspicious, and ever since then, uh, since that prayer meeting incident, she seemed to target my family with uh, trying to make us really uncomfortable. One time, Madison was in the back, you know, call me Grammy, Ma you know, poor little Madison, she's a little girl. And Madison said something kind of funny, and she looked at Madison and said, you must never say that, and she slapped her with her gloves in front of mom, you know, and, and just 
kind of like, you know, did you see that? That should make you uncomfortable. Just doing little things like that to make the parents, make other people, just kind of, uh, especially us as parents, we felt very uncomfortable around her. And she seemed to know that we were suspicious about her being one of these things described in this book here. And then something happened that I think confirmed our suspicions. Now this is a schematic floor, blue, uh, floor plan of uh, Walmart, a typical Walmart. This is our, our Fort Payne Walmart. This is where we always go to shop in Walmart. Um, one day, Mickey and the kids were shopping at Walmart, and then they came in through uh, the front door. You see here we have the public restroom. That's a, if you've been to Walmart, this is kind of how the super Walmarts are laid out. The bathrooms and all the courtesy desk and all that kind of stuff is up front here, the optometry. and you know. So Mickey comes in with the kids, has a cart. She walks through this. This is the what? What section is this, usually? Yeah, it's the produce in the grocery, right? The yeah. produce is out front. Mickey and the kids, they come in, they walk through the produce. They're going to go up the, one of the grocery aisles here, but they get to about right there where those shoe prints are. And look over here, they see Ms. T coming down with a shopping cart, an empty shopping cart. And Ms. T didn't see them, they didn't think. So what they said, oh, they don't want to, they don't want to be around her. You know, Mama doesn't want her kids around Ms. T, really. You know? So Mama, as quick as she can, she runs with the cart. Run, 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 way over here. She comes up just before she gets to the shoe aisle. Guess who comes out of the aisle between domestics and shoes, just comes popping out of the aisle. Guess who came out there? Miss T with that shopping cart came, come, came out of there, and she had this funny little walk. She walked out of there, and she looked at my wife, and, to, and kind of was, gave her a, a little smirky smile. She goes, and just walked right by her. Now, can you explain how that happened? She's 80, 86 years old, whoever knows how old. And my wife, is, uh, she's got the advantage as far as distance to get over here. How did, how would she cut, she all the way over here and coming out of this aisle here? And then one of you are laughing, but anyways. <laughs> so we had, so I, and that really made us suspicious now, right? I mean, then I go, well, the Lord is telling us something. This is an, this is an evil angel, I think. Had the elders, we had an elders meeting, and we wondered, what, what do we do about this? Now, what did Paul do in Acts chapter 16? Now, what happened? How did that, that whole situation with the uh, lady that did the, did the uh, soothsaying, how did that end up? Well, it says here, after many days, this is going on, verse 18, Paul, being grieved, finally, said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus, come out of her, and the evil spirit came out. So we had the elders meeting. We considered disfellowshipping her. And of course, why were we afraid of that? Well, sympathizers. Right? We didn't know what to do, so we called the conference. And the conference decided to come out secretly. This is the, uh, the, the uh, Gulf States Conference. One of the leaders came out secretly and uh, kind of decided to join in with Sabbath school and see what's going on over there in Rainsville. And so uh, he came out. It was Sabbath school time. None of us really kind of knew that he was there. We kind of saw him over there when we came to Sabbath school. He was off by himself inside over there. And Ms. T's in the in Sabbath school class. And guess who's teaching that day? Yours truly. I, 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 had, I wasn't supposed to be teaching that day. But nobody else wanted to teach that day for some reason. And the reason they didn't want to teach was because the Sabbath school quarterly for that day just happened to be on this subject. <laughs> the personality of the Holy Spirit. And they, they foresaw a argument, some contention. If they're teaching, they've got these anti-Trinitarians out there. This is going to not look good here. Something's going to, I don't, let Laren teach it. And this is, I love this doctrine. And so I didn't, I didn't really know, you know, what was going on with the conference or anything, but I was very happy to teach this, you know. And uh, so I went to church that day, and I forgot my glasses, you know, my reading glasses. And I need those glasses to see my notes. And when I got there, I go, oh, I forgot my glasses. So some saint in the audience said, well, I've got some glasses you can borrow. Oh, that's better than nothing. They were reading glasses. Put them on, and boy, sure enough, I could see my notes. I couldn't see anything else. They were just, I had this one and a half foot bubble I could see out of. Everything else was blurry. But I needed to see that note so I could teach this house. Look, I, I see that guy in the conference, and you know, he probably wants us to do a good job today. It's, you know, he's here, and we're teaching the Sabbath school core, let's do a good job here. And so, so I'm teaching away there and I can't see out of my one and a half foot bubble. 
And so what was going on here is I'm teaching on the Holy Spirit and, uh, you know, the Helper and the Holy Spirit. We're talking all these texts that bring out the divinity of this one being. He's God and all. And unbeknownst to me, I couldn't see it because of my blurry vision. Ms. T's out in the audience just uh, fuming away. Oh, she's mad. She's elbowing people and disrupting and, and grumbling. And, I, and I'm just totally in my own little world having a great time. I think I'm getting amens and I can't hear it. I don't see a thing out there. But there was some, 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 something going on out in the congregation and, uh, and, and she was one of the instigators and finally she would get up and, and, and she kind of got up and slammed out of, the, out of the room. She got out and went into the lobby and started walking back and forth and she was grumbling about this blasphemy going on and this, this, this wrong teaching, it's heresy in the church and, and you gotta stop doing that. I have no idea what's going on. I'm just having a good time. We're just teaching it. It's right from the Bible and the, the lesson is going on, and here's this Miss T out there fuming in the hall, and all the church got to see that. The whole church sort of realized, and so did the conference leader, that something must be done. This is not healthy for the church, and this church is not going to be able to grow until they take care of some groundwork here. So we had a meeting finally, and what happened, we voted, finally the church voted unanimously, finally to disfellowship uh, this person with a restraining order. So, and we, the conference recommended that. She did try to come back a few times, <coughs> and that restraining order did us a lot of good because that was legal permission to keep this person off of the campus. And that, that brought a lot of health back to the church. So Satan, he's stalking the church. It's Satan who wants to bring discord among the brethren. Remember? God hates discord, remember that? It said, God says he hates discord, Paul says to note those who cause this division and avoid them. The Bible says, till we all come into the, what's that word again? To the unity of the faith, that we henceforth be no more children. What does the devil like to do with us? Toss us to and fro, get us disunified. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slide of, of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait and deceive. Now, if you're interested, we have on, um, I have for Desire Media, we have two essays that you can just ask for, and, and here's an email. Just email me, learn at desiremedia.org, for a copy of these essays, essays from the Ellen G. White, E.G. White estate. One is on E.G. White's Trinitarian statements. Also, there's one, uh, I've got another one on E.G. White's feast-keeping statements. So I think that just maybe God allowed me and my family to go through this experience in order to expose this offshoot. So that's, that's my experience with an anti-Trinitarian. <laughs>